It comes through the gifts of the Holy Spirit. It's not going to be done carnally. It's going to be done through prayer and intercession in the name of Jesus. Ask and ye shall receive. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. There's power in us to bring healing and miracles and signs and wonders in the name of Jesus. Nothing shall be impossible to us. Nothing shall be withheld from us because we are walking uprightly before the Lord. I break generational curses. I break it in the name of Jesus Christ. May there be a change that takes place for the glory of the Lord. In Jesus' name. And welcome today to Word Alive. I'm Pastor Bob Rogers from Louisville, Kentucky. And it's an honor to come into your home today. You know, we're living in a very difficult time. And I had an angel of the Lord come to me at 3.33 in the morning. And over the years, when I've had visitations of angels, and I've had many, especially when I fast, and this angel came to me and told me of things that were going to happen all the way up through November. I, I saw many cities burning, two cities burning in particular. I saw on the end of September, beginning Sunday night, the 27th, and on the 28th, something spiritual that happened that changed. There was a major change that took place. And I want to send to you the book. I put it in this little booklet entitled, the visitation and uh, it uh, shares about two cities in our nation that are going to be under judgment one is on the east coast and one is on the west coast both of those cities are portal cities or they're gateway cities for principalities that have come and made war on the church and on america i want you to have this i believe it'll be a blessing to you and I just ask you to send a generous gift, and I'll be glad to rush this to you. This book is being actually fulfilled day after day after day. And you'll see, you'll see as you read it, some of these have already taken place, but there's a lot more that will take place. The information how you can receive it, receive it is right there on the screen, so I'll wait to hear from you. Right now, let's go into our services. Take your Bible and hold it to the Lord. If you don't have a Bible, hold your hand up to the Lord. But I want you to make this profession with me. Say, this is the Bible. And I believe it's true. It's a light into my pathway. It's a lamp into my feet. It's a road map all the way to heaven. And that's where I'm headed. Because I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do, and I can be what it says I can be, in Jesus' name. I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Zephaniah, Zephaniah 3.9. Say that with me, Zephaniah 3.9. For then I will turn to the people of pure language, that they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve Him with one consent. For then I will turn the people to a pure language that they may call upon the Lord to serve Him with one consent. Father, anoint Your Word with great power. And everyone said, Amen. And you may be seated. Prophecy is a very unique uh, part of God. Almost 60% of the Bible are prophecies. And so what happens? People, they fall into sin. There are certain demonic spirits and principalities over regions of the world. Over one region, there is a different principality than over another region. And then when that principality and when those demonic spirits uh, influence people to a place of sin, then God pronounces judgment, and these prophets would prophesy against this. And then after uh, the judgment comes and a new group of people come and a move of God comes and they repent, God begins to bring the blessings. And then the same demonic spirits are there. They haven't moved. They don't move from Florida, from Florida to Kentucky. They stay in that district. So those same spirits bring about the same curses 
And a prophecy will repeat itself. Sometimes they repeat themselves every 500 years, every 1,000 years. And so you can read a prophetic word that maybe was fulfilled at a certain time, but then it becomes activated again. And sometimes it is fulfilled again and again and again. That's why it's the living word of God. This particular prophecy is very interesting because... Uh, the Jewish people say it was fulfilled in uh, the early 1900s. Uh, they say that pure language is Hebrew, and you'll be speaking Hebrew when you get to heaven. But actually, Hebrew was a lost language. When the Jews were taken into captivity during the Persian Empire of Nebuchadnezzar, they eventually, 60% of the Jews got into the ancient Soviet Union. And so their language became Russian, it became Yiddish, it became Polish, it became German. And they didn't speak Hebrew, just like someone who came here from Germany, their kids may not speak German. Or you'll have a lot of Hispanic kids, and now they're in their second generation, they don't even speak Spanish. And so the Hebrew language was lost, and it became like Latin. It was studied, but never spoken. And then in the early 1900s, there was a Jewish educator by the name of Ben Yehuda. Ben Yehuda would not allow his children to speak anything but Hebrew. His wife could never speak a word of anything else. The fact is, she would be uh, extremely reprimanded. And so he began to develop a Hebrew dictionary for words that were not during the Bible days, like airplane and like highway and like automobile. And so he expanded the uh, dictionary for the Hebrew language. So when he became the principal and the headmaster of a school in Jerusalem, and the Jewish kids began to immigrate and some spoke Yiddish, and some spoke Polish, and so forth. He would not allow them to speak in that language. Are y'all listening? I don't want to put anybody to sleep here, because it's going to get better. But he would not allow them to speak in any of those uh, languages. He taught them Hebrew. And then it began to catch on to other schools, and then it caught on to the whole nation. And that's why the Jewish people, they speak Hebrew. They read Hebrew, and if they find some ancient um, discovery, and it has written Hebrew in it, it's just like reading the paper, even though it was written 3,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, and they say that is the fulfillment of the Scripture. And I believe it is a secondary fulfillment. But the primary fulfillment took place on the day of Pentecost. When the church received the baptism in the Holy Spirit, and they received the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and they received their prayer language of praying in other tongues. Now, let me read this in a few other translations. In the New International Version, it says, Then will I purify the lips of the peoples, and all of them may call on the name of the Lord and serve Him from shoulder to shoulder, or all equal. In uh, the Living New Translation, I will purify the speech of all people so that everyone can worship the Lord together. The English Standard Version, For at that time will I change the speech of the peoples to a pure speech, that all of them may call upon the name of the Lord and serve Him with one accord. The Berean Bible says, For then will I restore pure lips to the people, that all may call upon the name of the Lord and serve Him shoulder to shoulder or be equal. In other words, when the baptism of the Holy Spirit was poured out on the, on the day of Pentecost, the people begin to speak with other tongues. And for the first time, they begin to speak in a pure language. Whether you know it or not, we are all, we are all affected by our background, where we come from, by our education, by our race. And so when we get down to pray, all of these things come into the factors as we, as we pray in our native lung, language, in the, our case, English. But when we begin to pray in the Holy Ghost, it becomes pure. 
It becomes without racism, without prejudice, without hurts or bruises, without things that have happened in our life that affect the way we think and how our outlook in life. And so when we pray in the Holy Ghost, it is a power language. It is a language that God has ordained and that, that we can rise up and we can come against evil spirits and evil powers and it brings us level together. Now, here's what the Bible says. Of those men born of women, Matthew 11, 11, of those men born of women, there's none greater than John the Baptist. And he says, but the least of you is greater than John the Baptist. Now, what Jesus said was that John the Baptist was a very unique person in that he had an understanding of God and he, had a, he was a level above Father Abraham. He was above the, the spirituality of Jacob, of David in the Bible, of all those great prophets. He was greater than them all. But then he said, because we live in a time when the outpouring of the Holy Spirit will come, we, the least of you who receives this impartation of this baptism of the Holy Spirit, will have a greater anointing to pray, a greater empowerment to come against demons and rulers of darkness than any of those that were in the Old Covenant. It's the power of the Holy Spirit and the use of the gifts of the Holy Spirit in our prayer language of praying in tongues. Now, this prophecy was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost, that God would give us a prayer language, a power language, uh, he would impart to us strength. And in the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verse 26. Come on, wave at me out here. Say, I love this verse. Come on, all fishermen ought to love this verse. Come on, all fishermen, wave at me. Hallelujah. Here's what it says. It says, I, it says, it says and God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness, and let him have dominion. Say dominion. dominion. Over the fish of the sea, over the fowls of the air, over all the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. God's given us victory over creeps. Hallelujah. And the way that God has given us that is through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so when you begin to pray in the Holy Spirit, there's something that rises up again within you. And God releases an anointing that is able to defeat the, the demonic spirits that bring sickness to you. Now, you may get sick and you don't know what's wrong. I, man, I don't feel good. Well, you don't know that maybe it's a curse. It's a generational curse. You, you may not be aware that this, this is the enemy that comes against you. And the Bible calls many times spirits of infirmity. Those are demons. Demons that bring sickness to you. And, but you don't know. You take an aspirin, you take an Advil, you take ibuprofen. But as you begin to pray in the Spirit, the Holy Ghost knows what that is. The Holy, knows, the Holy Ghost knows how to combat against hexes and curses and cancer and demon spirits. And as you pray in the Spirit, there's a rising up of victory, of empowerment that enables you to be healed and overcome the work of the devil. So when you pray in the Holy Ghost, God gives you an advantage over the devil. He gives you an advantage over evil spirits. Listen, the devil doesn't know anything. He doesn't know all things. He, doesn't, he can't read your mind. He plants things in your mind, but he can't read what you're thinking. He, he, Satan didn't even know that Jesus was the Messiah. I mean, here, here Satan has his little, little ball-headed imps in the palace of King Herod. And here comes three wise men. They come in and said, we've come from uh, a far way off. We've traveled 1,500 miles on that camel and we are worn out. Is there a massage therapist or a chiropractor we can see? And they come in there and they said, there is a king that is born. Now, Herod said, I, don't, I didn't know anything about that. And so he calls his Bible scholars, and they, they say, well, the Bible prophesies that, that a Messiah would be born, and he would be born in Bethlehem. And those demon imps, they took the message back to hell. That's the first time they knew 
that it was, it was the season. So when the wise men do not come back, they're warned of God not to do so. Satan moves in the heart of Herod, and he decides, I'm not going to have anybody that's not in my bloodline to rise up and become king. And his troops moved in and killed the male children two years of age and under. That'll take care of wiping out whoever that Messiah is. But God warned Joseph in a dream. An angel came to him, and they left the country. They went down to Egypt for three years. And then when Herod died, this angel spoke to Joseph to come back, and he went to Nazareth, fulfilling the scripture, he shall be called a Nazarene. And so Satan thought he had taken care of this Messiah. He was dead. And it wasn't until John the Baptist baptized Jesus and Jesus came up out of the water and a voice came from heaven after a dove set upon Christ's head and said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And it was at that moment, at that moment, did he know that Jesus was the Messiah. He was the one that was sent to crush the head of the serpent. And that's when the war broke out between God and and the devil. And so, when you pray in tongues, when you begin to pray in the Holy Ghost, Satan doesn't have a clue what you're praying about. You are, you are speaking in Navajo Indian language where the Japanese are concerned. You're speaking in a language that Satan can't decipher, and he can't intercept, and he cannot figure out what is going on. It's a language of power and authority in Jesus' name. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, in the fourth, uh, ch fourth verse, and I love, I I've always quoted this in the King James, and says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down of imaginations, and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Now, the NIV reads it this way. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. They are, they are the gifts of the Holy Ghost. And so we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ that we will be ready to punish. Say punish. Every act of disobedience once your obedience is complete. God gives us through the power of the Holy Spirit to punish demons who bring sickness. Punish the demons who've attacked your precious children. God gives us this power in the name of Jesus. Now, let me read this. Let me read this in the Message Bible. How many have the Message Bible? It's one of the great Bible translations, and let me read it to you. The world is unprincipled. It's a dog eat dog out there. The world doesn't fight fair. But we don't live or fight our battles that way either. Listen, I don't fight fair. God doesn't expect you to fight fair. He sends you to battle with weapons that Satan cannot compete with. Come on. It says, but we don't live or fight our battles that way, neither have and never will. The tools of our trade aren't for marketing or for manipulation. They're not for sale. But they are for demolishing that entire massively corrupt culture. Say culture. Did you know there are cultural sins? They are sins of our society. And we're under a curse because of the sins of our society. And so God says, I am releasing gifts of the Holy Spirit. Your prayer language of the Spirit will help 
destroy corrupt cultural sins. And it goes on, we use our powerful God tools for smashing warped philosophies. I mean, does our world have some warped way of thinking? Tearing down barriers erected against the truth of God, fitting every loose thought and emotion and impulse into the structure of life shaped by Christ. Our tools are ready at the hands for clearing the ground of every obstruction and building lives of obedience and maturity. Now I want you to notice these words. Demolishing, demolishing that massively corrupt society that we live in right now. Our words through the Holy Ghost, our words through praying in the Spirit, can demolish this corrupt society and sins that have, have come upon us and smashing warped philosophies. Now, because of spineless preachers and deacon boards that won't allow preachers to stand up and preach against sins, and because of our government who passed a law in the mid-50s called the Johnson Amendment that said preachers cannot preach from churches against anything political or they'll lose their 501c3 and tax exemption. The church has shut down when it's come to cultural sins and the devil has taken over. Lyndon B. Johnson was from Texas. He was a senator that had won election after election. He was no comp nobody was a, uh, his competition. And a 30-year-old young Republican lawyer ran against him who couldn't win an election as a dog catcher. He runs against him, and H.L. Hump, the billionaire oil man, and Garnett, who has, was the big, big um, newspaper magnet who owned the USA Today, that's a Gannett uh, property. The Courier-Journal is owned by Gannett. Well, these two guys didn't like Johnson. The fact is, they thought he was soft on communism, and there were a bunch of preachers that didn't like him either because he was a womanizer. He had girlfriend here, a girlfriend there. Ladybird wasn't the only bird in the cage. And so they preached against him, and he was so angry that there was a tax bill that was a joint Republican-Democrat. Eisenhower was trying to reform the tax system and the tax code, so they had come with a law, and the day that the vote was to be taken, taken, and they were wanting this through, it was Lyndon Johnson who finagled his way to add this one paragraph that a religious or a nonprofit organization could not oppose any um, candidate. If they did, they'd lose their 501c3. And it wasn't even discussed, voted on. It was one of those yes or no votes, all in favor say aye, it's passed. And because of that, the liberals have used that to bully the church anytime they have risen up to fight abortion, anytime they've come against uh, any type of law, if they will penalize you, will take away your status as a church. And so we have had a generation to rise up that if any preacher gets up and he preaches against a public sin, all oh, that preacher's just meddling in the politics. I wish he'd leave that alone and preach the Bible when actually it is the Bible. It's a sin to kill babies. It's wrong. And it's wrong to vote for a politician that'll kill babies too. And so now... Here we have an opportunity that Roe could reverse Wade. We could, where it could be, it, uh, there could not be this, this abortion even when babies are born. And we can bring victory, but it's, going, it's a spiritual battle. And it comes through prayer. It comes through the gifts of the Holy Spirit. It's not going to be done carnally. It's going to be done through prayer and intercession in the name of Jesus, for the glory of God. Hallelujah. Whatsoever we bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatsoever we loose on earth is loose in heaven. That's found in 
Matthew 16, 19, and then it's turned around in Matthew 18, 18, it says the same thing. What's that all about? Well, that is a Hebrew idiom or way of saying when it is repeated once again that if you don't get anything right, I want you to at least get this. If you don't remember anything I said, at least remember this. You've got power to bind and to loose. That's what it says. We have power to bind and loose, but how do we do it? We do it through the Holy Ghost. We do it through spiritual warfare. We do it through praying in other tongues. So today, we must pray and allow the Holy Spirit to break every curse that Satan would try to put upon our land, upon our children, upon our governors. Did you know many of our governors, are, they want to do good, but they're, they're cursed. Their minds are, are twisted. They, 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 they don't know what is right. Our mayors, our mayors, our, our, our congressmen, they have a warped philosophy. We must pray that Roe versus Wade will be broken, but we turned over. And when it does, a curse will be broken off of our country. When it happens, a, a weight will be lifted off of you and me. We have to come against the evil doctrines of evolution, against the educational uh, system we have, against Congress. We have to stand against that. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's program. And I want to say before we leave the air, the book entitled The Visitation, I Want You to Have It. Uh, this book uh, explains some of the things that the Lord showed me by a visitation of an angel, and it happened on two times. One on June the 27th, and the other on June the 3rd. I wrote down notes, and I'm glad I did because I'd forgotten some of those points. But I share with you what God showed me. A great revival is gonna come at the end of all this. It's gonna be a move of God that will touch the high, the low, the rich, the poor. It'll touch young people, it'll touch college age students, it'll touch political people, and there's gonna be some politicians, God says enough is enough, and you'll never hear from them again. It tells about hurricanes and earthquakes in parts of the country where I saw real trouble headed. The visitation, that information, how you can receive it is right there on the screen. Just send a generous gift that will help pay for the book, the postage, the handling, and help us spread the gospel. God bless you, and I look forward to seeing you next week at this same time. After two encounters with angels, Dr. Bob Rogers shares the story of what he saw in his new book titled The Visitation. The book outlines what God showed Dr. Rogers about the future of America, a spiritual awakening, natural disasters, the presidential elections, and so much more. We would like to make this available to those who will send their best gift in support of the ministry. Simply go to BobRogersMinistries.org or call 888-613-6080 to request your copy of The Visitation today. Break generational curses. I break it in the name of Jesus Christ. May there be a change that takes place for the glory of the Lord. In Jesus' name.